All right, I want you guys to uh, I'm shift gears from those great songs. Um, the uh, you guys, some of you have dogs, right? Yeah. Do you love your dog? Yes. Yeah. Does your dog whine sometimes? Yes. Tell me, tell me what a whining dog sounds like. Come on. Okay, I'm going to talk to you today about why that sound and that idea is the key to living an abundant life. Okay, really is. Okay, and and um, um, we're going to look at uh, uh, we're looking at sevens, right? Today we're going to look at seven supplements. Okay, to faith and and um, and the concept we're going to explore comes from um, the Apostle Peter's last words to the church. And now Peter was a guy that had quite a journey with, with Christ, you know, but when someone speaks, especially a guy like Peter, when he speaks his last words, you know, so, sometimes, you know, when someone says, these are my final words to you, okay, and you know they're going to check out, you pay attention, correct? Because something good is likely going to come. And, and, and uh, especially when the speaker is a, a guy who had this personal journey with Christ that started off, he, he started off as this young really unrefined guy and and uh, um, and 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 he was he was really kind of clumsy in the way he started off his journey and but his pursuit of God was really zealous and at times he just didn't have the tempering influence of wisdom okay and and uh, and and he was someone though that that really deliberately and consistently grew into what became his apostolic role I mean just this huge role in, in, in the in the history of the Christian church and and uh, he had he, he developed personal growth and he and he developed as a human being and as a fully fledged follower of, of Christ and, and, a, and a messenger of this and 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 he's giving these these final words and, and he says this in the first chapter of 2nd Peter he says what I'm gonna to say to you today he says this I, I will always remind you about these things this is super important, is what he's saying. Okay, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth that you already have. You already know this stuff, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remind you. He says, it's not only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live, but, I'm, but our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. He's saying, I know I'm gonna die soon. And so I will work hard to make sure that even after I'm gone, you remember these things. And so we've got his book, okay? We've got his, 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 his writing. Let me read the passage to you. It comes out of 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this. He says, God's divine power has given us everything we need, everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, okay, this, this, this knowledge, this, 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 these gifts he's given to us, He's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world. And for this reason, here's, here's, here are the supplements. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness or moral excellence or virtue. Be the same word. And then to your goodness, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. And to self-control, add perseverance. And to perseverance, add godliness. And to godliness, have brotherly love, mutual affection. And to your mutual affection, have love. For if these, if these qualities are yours in increasing, they will render you, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, having forgotten that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will, here's a promise, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'll always remind you of these things, even though you already know them. Okay? Now, I hope you, had, you got a handout when you came in today. Did you? Did you get a handout? Take a look at that. Let's look at it in a different way. But let me, before I do that, let me, let me talk to you about this. Let me hear the, that whining dog again. Okay, right? Um, the, 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 the thing that comes behind this, I believe, and we're going to look at this today, is something that Apostle Paul talked about, okay? And the theme in Paul's writings involves us having inside of us, if, you've, if, you've, if you have faith in Jesus, 
okay? The idea is, is that you have two natures inside of you. Think about your life. You have this old nature, right, that you're still prone to live by, and then you have this new nature, okay, that's inside of you that you strive, hopefully, hopefully, to live by, okay? Think of it like this. You have your own yard, okay? And there are two dogs living in your yard, okay? You have two of them. We all do, okay? And, and we have the old dog that lives in our yard, and then we have this new dog that God has placed into our yard, okay? The old dog wants to be fed, okay? And the idea is, is whichever dog you feed, that's the one that's going to become stronger and is going to dominate the yard, okay? So the, the, the whole goal of the Christian life is to hear, <laughs> See, I, you guys do it better than me, come on. <laughs> yeah. From which dog? From the old dog. The old dog's going to beg for food. The old dog's going to want you to feed it so it can get stronger, okay? And, and, and the instruction is, I don't care how much it whines, I don't care how, how fragile it looks, how sickly it looks, let it die. Okay? Don't feed it. But then there's this beautiful little puppy you got in your house. Okay? And he says, feed that one. Okay? These dogs are in opposition to each other. Our, the whole idea of the Christian life is to learn how to feed that new dog, okay? And let that old dog, you know, whine all at once and don't feed it. Does that make sense? Okay? And so here's your seven supplements. It's so awesome there's seven up to our saving faith. With a lot of elbow grease, whereas the Bible says applying all diligence in verse 5 of 2 Peter 1, it says this is the new dog's food. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and this higher love. If these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Now, who wants to be useless? Okay? Who wants to be fruitless? Okay? No, we want to be useful and fruitful, right? That will render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The old dog's food, in contradiction, is moral depravity, ignorance, okay? Self-indulgence, just giving up, ungodliness, cruelty or apathy towards other people, and hate. Those who have those qualities, they're blind or short-sighted, having forgotten their purification from the former sins. And the bottom line is, if we create a life pattern of starving the old dog and feeding the new dog, God promises we will never stumble or fall away and that we'll become sure of what he's already sure of and that's our eternally bright future with him. Got it? So we can just go home? I mean, you know, you guys good with that? Okay, let's, let's unpack it a little bit, okay? The idea here is this. This idea of faith is that the, the right standing before God, salvation, if you will, that we get saved from, from this awful destiny, okay? That we get saved, we get plucked out. The only way that happens is it's granted to us, okay? We do the one thing everybody can do and so many people won't do, and we just admit our need, and we bow the knee, and we say, Lord, it's me. I'm the problem, okay? And would you, would you, would you forgive me? And he says, yes. I will, based on what Jesus did for you. And, 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 and you, then you get to decide how you're going to live. Do you want to live a stumbly, you know, kind of self-defeated existence for the rest of your life? Or do you want to live a sure-footed, prevailing life, the high road or the low road? It's our choice. And the idea is, is what Peter is telling us is that the key to it is adding the right necessary supplements to this faith, okay? Adding these right qualities. Now, the first one is moral excellence, virtue, okay? The idea is, is that develop the habit of doing the right things, okay? Having good morality about you, you know? And, and vice is the practice of immorality, he says. And, and, and Paul, I, like I mentioned, like, for instance, in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about these, this old dog and this new dog kind of idea, this old nature and new nature. He says this in, in Galatians chapter 5. He says, when you follow the desires of your old nature, okay, when you feed the old dog, here's the results. This is what it produces. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, hostility. Think about our world. Quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions. Feeling that everyone is wrong except for those in your own little group. 
We don't do that. Aren't you glad that people don't do that in the world, right? Envy, drunkenness, other kinds of stuff. And, and, and it goes on, okay? And then he, he concludes his little discussion with a description of what the new dog looks like, okay? He says this, but when the Holy Spirit controls your life, the, when the new dog gets fed, this, this is the kind of life it produces, a life that's filled with love, joy, peace. Isn't this the life you want? Don't you want your spouse to be this way? Don't you want your kids to be this way? Don't you want your friends, your workmates to be this way? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the, the, he, what he's saying here is that if whatever you give yourself to, that's what's going to get produced in your life. In other words, you reap what you sow. Okay? If you starve the old dog and feed the new dog, you get a better life okay, in this life, and then you get sure about your destiny, and you, and you, you secure yourself. You know for sure that when that diagnosis comes, when you get the phone call that the accident happened and stuff, you can live with a sense of confidence that it's okay. As a matter of fact, it's better than okay because this person was one of God's kids. Make sense? Okay, so the idea is add, the first quality is add right living, moral excellence. The second one is knowledge. Now in this passage, the Apostle Peter talks about knowledge in two different ways. One way is this kind of relationship knowledge, okay? Like, I know my wife, okay? We're a husband and wife, right? It's a relationship, the idea of knowing someone. And he says that we can come, we can know God just like we can know a person. We come into relationship with him and then we know him. Make sense? And then he talks about knowledge in a different way. It's a growing kind of knowledge, the understanding to know something about him, okay? The idea is to grow in it. The idea is, is that through Jesus, we can, we can know God relationally, okay? And then he talks about it in another way, and this is the way he's talking about it here in this passage. We can grow in our knowledge of him, okay? Now, when you got married, um, you know, you did it for better, for worse, for richer, or poorer, sickness and in health, and all that kind of stuff, right? Those words are probably said at some point, right? And now, did you really know that person? I mean, really? Well, how do you get... Yeah. You didn't really know them. You thought you did. Because you thought, those words are... I love doing weddings. I, I, just, I just love doing weddings. Because there's this couple standing in front of me. They have no idea what they're getting into. They have no idea what they're promising. Okay, you know, it's like, oh, it's just going to be so great all the time. You know, and, and uh, it's like, okay, well, we're going to say the words anyway. Okay, because this is a good starting point, you know, and stuff. But we grow in our knowledge of the other person, right? The same is true in our relationship with God. We know him. We come into relationship with him. But then what he's saying, what we need to add to our faith is we need to grow in our understanding of who he is. We grow in our relationship with him through the scriptures, by coming to church, listening to messages, by reading on our own, by downloading a Bible app, you know, hitting the play button. The best one out there, I think, is version. version. okay? It's a great Bible app. Get it, okay? You, you, just, you push a little button on whatever translation you got, and it's like magic. On your Bluetooth in your car, it reads it to you. There's like some dude that just goes, and if you don't like that guy's voice, pick another version, and then there'll be another dude reading it to you, because I don't know if they have any women doing it. I'm sorry, I don't know why. I, I didn't make the, the rules, I didn't make the algorithm. But the, um, the idea is this, we can grow in our knowledge of God. And he's saying, don't just stay there, do right, but then also apply yourself and grow in your understanding of who he is, and it'll serve you well in this life, okay? The third thing is, and you think about it, it makes sense, if you're gonna be moral ex morally excellent, and if you're gonna discipline yourself to grow in your knowledge, you need self-control, right? You gotta control yourself and, and do, do the right things. Dis discipline yourself to do that. He says this is the third supplement to faith. And how you do that? You, you control yourself by controlling your environment, making sure you go to the right places, right? You control yourself by counteracting bad inclinations with something good, right? You, you control yourself by meeting legitimate needs, not in illegitimate ways, 
but in legitimate ways, okay? And you control yourself sometimes just by being Iron Man McGurk and just being a like, sure act of the will. Mm, I won't do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, right? Okay. It, it reminds me of a, of, a, of a song kids used to sing. Oh, careful little eyes what you see. Right? Oh, careful little eyes what you see. There's a father ab above looking down in tender love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. And it's, be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little tongue what you say. Be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little feet where you go. It's really simple. Like a, like a child's game. It has to do with your eyes, your ears, your tongue your hands and your feet, right? Control yourself. Have some self-control, okay? Make sense? And then here's the thing. So yeah, you're doing this stuff and then life starts catching up with you. And, and, um, and then you find yourself in a place where times are tough and you wanna give up, okay? And the, the fourth thing is persevere. Hang in there. Perseverance is so underrated in our world. I really believe that. Perseverance can make tough marriages great again. Perseverance make difficult startups profitable sometimes. You know, they make friendships even better. There's a passage in Hebrews 12.12 that 12, says this. I love this. It's, he's talking to people who are discouraged and they want to give up. And he says this, take a new grip. Take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. And keep going. Sometimes what you got to do in life is you just gotta, you gotta just like suck it up, Buttercup, and you gotta say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on, I'm gonna grip and grin, right? And just go, is that all you got? Really? Is that all you got? Perseverance is so underrated. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think about something maybe you're going through, something in your life that requires perseverance right now, requires you to hang in there. You know, to hold on and, and hope for something better. And, and what I want you to do now is I want you to stand up. Some of you are going to really hate me after I do this to you. But um, I want you to stand up. Because what I really believe is perseverance requires friends. Okay? It requires people to get around you and help you persevere. And so what I want you to do is think about that thing. Okay, your own personal thing. You're not going to share it with anybody. Don't worry about that. But what I want you to do is I want you to turn around and I want you to grip and grin. Okay? Go ahead. Grip and grin. And say, hang in there. That's why Christ gives us his church, okay? To help us grip and grin sometimes because we need people to help us sometimes get through those tough times where we need somebody to hold on to, somebody to encourage us, right? So you can do this, okay? And then just slap a silly grin on your face and keep going. Just keep going, okay? Sometimes life, that's it. And so the, the, the fifth one is godliness. Okay, now here's, here's the thing. What do you think about when you think about hanging around with a godly person? Jesus, piety. Think about like, okay, I'm going to go on a road trip with a godly person. No fun. Yeah, no fun, right? I mean, it's like, it's like, right? Because we have all these ideas of what godliness is and what that might look like in life, you know, and stuff. And, and, and a lot of them aren't really... You know, you might want to give the right answer. Yeah, I guess I'm in church. I have to say I'd like to go on a road trip with a godly person. But the truth is I want the real answer, which is like, no thanks. All right? And, and uh, um, now, here, we, but we have to make sure we've got the right definition, the right goal in mind. And, and like the Apostle Paul in, in his, his letter to Timothy, he talks about what godliness looks like in the real world. And, and, and it might challenge your idea of what Godliness, maybe the way godliness has been displayed in your life and, and stuff. You know, he says this, real godliness in chapter 6, he says real godliness in 1 Timothy includes contentment. Like you're just a content person, no matter what's going on. You've learned that secret 
of contentment, that a, a, a contentment that tran in the context that transcends earthly measurements of wealth. That you're happy no matter what's going on. And, and in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, he says that they don't act holier than thou. Okay, they don't lord over people. They don't, they don't, and when you think about godly people, that person you were going to do that road trip with, how were they in your mind? Like looking down at you, right, and, and uh, you know, and, and stuff. In fact, you, what, we're, what people who act holier than thou, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the beginning of that chapter, he says, stay away from people like that. Can I hear a hallelujah? Yeah, yeah and then, uh, you know, and, and, uh, um, in, 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 in Titus chapter 2, he talks about how godly people are trustworthy and they make right choices. In other words, trustworthiness means they're people you can count on. They'll be there for you. They'll be there for you. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says this. Now, check this out. Now, I'm, 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 I'm interpreting this a little bit, but this is the right interpretation. They're not prone to conspiracy theories. <laughs> or other strange ideas, okay? Um, and, and they're full of, what they're full of, instead of the, that stuff, they're full of an eternal hope that affects the way they live now. It, it, it's evident in their life that they have hope. And, and uh, they're not just always, oh, did you hear, you know, this kind of stuff. And in and, and, and 2 Peter, a little bit later in this, in this book that we're looking at, chapter 2, he says they, he talks about how they found an identity that part, that, that, that where they've received a healthy kind of sense of self, a healthy self-worth and self-esteem. They they're confident and, they, and it serves them well in this life and it gives them the platform for which to serve other people. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, he talks about how they're eager to do good they pursue peace in their relationships. In other words, they're good friends. They're people you can count on. They're, you know, so think about that road trip again, okay? And it turns out that a godly person would probably be a pretty good person to go on a road trip with. Probably have a pretty good time. And it would probably be a pretty rich time. And, 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 so, and, when we, and here's the thing, here's the outcome. When we add these kinds of qualities to our faith, what ends up happening, what ends up tends to happening, I think, in our world, is that God, what, what God wants to produce in the world tends to get produced through us. We, it's almost like we, we bring up some of him to the, to the party. When, what God wants to say in the world tends to get said through us. What God wants to do in the world tends to get done through us. And what God wants people to experience in the world, they tend to experience through us. Because what we're doing is we're bringing him into the relationship. We're, bring, we're, we're throwing him in the car with us on the trip. That's the fifth thing. The sixth thing is that so, so, so far it's moral excellence or virtue. It's knowledge. It's self-control. It's perseverance. It's godliness. And now brotherly kindness. One of my sons lives near Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love, right? And that's the, that's the Greek word that's used for this. The, the idea of brotherly kindness, sisterly kindness, that we treat each other right. It's, that we're genuine, it's a friendship where genuine concern and mutual support are on tap. That's, that's what's going on. You know? and, and the idea we're a family. We've got civility going on here. We respect each other. You know, we have, there's politeness at some level. You know, we can kid around all we want, but the reality is, is that, that we respect each other, we honor each other, and, and we're there for each other. And he says that if I feed the new dog and starve the old dog, when I add friendship to my life, okay, friendship happens in this way, I think. I quit searching for good friends, and I start being that good friend that somebody would want to be friends with. Make sense? And what that involves is I always think about this as with the acronym CARE, okay, something I developed years ago. The, the, the C stands for CONCERN. Okay, that I'm concerned about other people. That's what a friend does, right? The, the A stands for I care, so I'm available to other people when they're in need, okay? The R stands for I'm resourceful. When my friend is in need, I might not know, I don't have to know all the answers, okay? But I'm gonna be resourceful for them, and, and together we're gonna try to figure it out. We're gonna try to find answers. And then the E stands for encouragement. 
I just bring encouragement into the situation, that friendship that, that, that is going to make them keep on going. And I love Jack Johnson. You, any of you know who Jack Johnson is? He wrote a song years ago. I mean, that's over 20 years ago for sure. It's called The Sharing Song. I think we should play it. I really do. But it's like, if, if you have two, give one to your friend. Okay? If you have three, give one to your friend and me. Be a good friend to other people. And if you have one, well, you can learn, you can, you can share by sharing with each other. Take turns with each other. If you, if you got a ball, bounce it to, to your friend, okay? If you got just one sandwich, cut the thing in half and share it, okay? Be a good friend. It'll serve them well, it'll serve you well. And then the last thing is this higher kind of love. Now, brotherly kindness and relationships, where, where that kind of mutual support's on tap, they, they tend to be a little bit transactional, right? A friend helps me, I help them, right? A little bit of this and that. But this last one is this idea that it's this kind of love that goes beyond a simple friendship, okay? It's this, relate, it's this thing where, where love, goodness, and kindness is extended, and the one extending it expects absolutely nothing in return in the transaction. There is no transaction. It's just a one-way street. And nobody spoke about the priority of love like Jesus did. Okay? He said that the best thing you can do, keep it real simple. He kept it really simple. The best thing you can do is live with passion for God, love for Him, and compassion for other people. If you do that, you got the whole thing all built right in. So here, let, me hear you, let me hear you do it. <laughs> Go starve that old dog this week, okay? By adding these qualities, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you make it simple for us. That if we create a life pattern of starving that old dog, that old nature, and feeding the new dog, the new nature that you've imparted to us, you promise that we will never stumble or fall away. Lord, we need this in, this, in, our, in our lives. And Lord, help us today, but also we, you tell us in this passage that, that if we do this, and we can stay consistent in it and grow in our understandings, grow in our ability to live the life you want us to live, that we will become sure of what you are already sure of, and that is our eternally bright future with you. Lord, we pray that you work in our lives. Help us to order our days around these ideas. It's in your name we pray. Amen.